find in the pew in front of you. To our members, you can do a card or respond to your online bulletin so that we'll know that you were here. We have special people here this morning, and I want to begin with Lucy Elizabeth Joy Hanley. Four names, because she's the fourth child, and this is her first Sunday with her parents, Rob and Ada. Well, We want to be able to see the baby. Now, this is really important, y'all. We're praying for this baby, but we're praying for Rob. He's now outnumbered five to one. <laughs> we need some serious prayer here, all right? Guys, we congratulate you. We welcome you. We thank you. We're going to ask Bill Bass, one of our elders, to have a prayer of blessing over you this morning. Let's pray together. Let's pray. God, what a joy and what a blessing to... Uh bring new life into the world, and what a blessing for this family, and what a blessing for this congregation, Father, that this family is, is a part of who we are. God, we thank you for the blessings of uh, a new baby. I, I, I know that there have been some sleepless nights already, and uh, there's probably more in the future, but God, I know there's also times of unspeakable joy in the, in the raising of a child. And we ask you to bless this family, and we ask you to be with them and to give them strength in the hard times and give them great joy in the good times. Father, I pray that uh, this congregation will provide an environment that will allow this child to grow up uh, to become a Christian woman. God, we will depend upon you to help us to do that. And God, we pray that you will bless this family. We pray that you'll bless Lucy as she grows. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you welcome them? All right, and this is very exciting. This is just mind-boggling to me. Uh, there was a reunion in town this weekend, and so we have about 15 or 20 kids 
who graduated from the years 94 to 97 who are not kids anymore. They're now here with their kids. And they were in my first youth ministry in 1992 and three and four. And so they survived. They lived in spite of me, right? So I'm going to ask them to stand. They were at a reunion, and we're having a lunch together today. If you're one of those, some of them you know, oh, there's Scott script. Look at that. Cherie and Lila and Andrea, Matt. Glad to see that you guys are alive and well. Really, I really am. We're going to enjoy lunch together later on. And also, this morning, we have special guests. I almost forgot you guys. All right, here we go. Justin and John Arriga are here. It says they have the welcome, but they don't really have the welcome. They kind of are part of the welcome. You guys come on up here and join me. Justin and John are our Hacienda of Hope directors. And they are in town. They get here about once a year. And so whenever they do, we like to get them up here because you hear about them all the time and this good work. Um, and it even is interesting to me. We had a starting point class this morning. We have 25 people going through starting point. So there's at least 25 people who don't know you guys, plus anybody else who's come here since the last year. Jonna um, lived, grew up in Ecuador from the time she was eight. Her parents are missionaries, still are down there. And so she um, grew up there. Justin hails from Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> which is about the prettiest place on earth if you've ever been there. Because I lived in Lubbock, Texas, so we have this kin spirit thing going. Right, okay. They, of course, have been at the Hacienda now for two years. So we've completed two, we're going into three. Yeah, if you hold those mics up, people will hear you a lot better. Two years this month. All right. Tell us, first of all, how you are, how the family is. We're good. The family's great. Uh, we left them back in Lubbock. Uh, with grandparents. With grandparents. Excellent plan. Yes. Very good plan for us. And you guys are well? <laughs> We're great, too. We are. We're doing really good. It's good to be home here in Alabama. We've, we've really felt like this is home for us, and it's, it's very encouraging to see all of you, uh, to just seen, you know, uh, had calls and also uh, have communication with y'all during, during the year. It's really been great for us. So tell us some new, great, exciting, happening things are going on. Uh, at the Hacienda Hope? Yes, that, that would be good. That would be good? Yes. Is that what you're going with? Oh, if you'd like to tell us something else. We, we, no, 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 we'd love to talk about the Hacienda Hope. We've had a really good year. Uh, it's been a really growing year for us. Uh, this year we have, uh, just since February, 11 new kids with us. So we have how many now? 28, uh, and that's not entirely true. We actually have 29 Christian who graduated. Uh, he's still on the payroll, uh, so he's going down uh, and doing mission work in Brazil through the AIM program and is enjoying that too. So we're, but we're 29 in, in Ecuador. Very good. Or 28 in Ecuador. What else? Exciting, big news. Uh, so, so we've got 11 kids. Uh, it's a really big thing for us. Uh, we've really watched them kind of grow and uh, get acclimated into what we're doing, uh, which has been a really cool thing. In fact, uh, um, it's, it's been a struggle at times. It's been a difficult situation for some of the kids, um, and it's been a growing experience for us. Uh, one of our kids, Blanca, she's got a, got a very interesting story of, uh, of, of kind of her first experiences tell and impressions. Tell me a story. Tell me a story. Okay, I'll tell you a story. Um, Blanca is actually um, a group part of a group of five siblings that we received May, sometime in May. And uh, one Sunday, I, had, I, have, I do the teenage girls sometimes, and we had talked about forgiveness in my class and how normally you forgive somebody because it really helps you heal. And so she's had to, to work on that. Well, that night, she, uh, she was sitting, she, she had had a panic attack, a really bad panic attack. And um, so I was helping her calm down. And she said, Miss Jonna, I'm really sorry, and I don't mean to disrespect you, and I know that it's not just you. There's people in the United States that have given me this opportunity to be here, but I really don't believe in the God that you talked about today. And I just, um, sorry. <laughs> she said, I've been praying, praying to him for the last four years to save me from what I was going through, and he never responded. And... Uh, so I sat there for a minute. I had to like, you know, get control. 
And I said, well, let's see. Let's see if you, you start seeing him in the next few months, and we're not, we're not pressuring you to believe in God. Um, I think he'll, he'll heal you, and so let's just give it some time. And she's just, it's been amazing to watch her gradually see God. And those of you that came um, probably witnessed her belting out the songs and, and praising God, and that's not from us forcing the Bible down her throat. It's just her seeing the love of God and seeing how he is and has come to her rescue. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a neat experience receiving these kids from the beginning and watching them change. That's the beautiful thing about this project. Yeah. We're looking for lifelong change because we're taking care of these kids for the entirety of their lives. And Definitely. so it's a great thing to do that long term. What can we be in prayer about? What can we be uh, thinking about, praying about, encouraging? in the next year? Uh, well, right now we're full up. Uh, we actually, with all these kids that have come in, these new 11, we are completely full. We're planning on moving out of the fourth casa. Because right now you guys are living in a casa, we're, but the house is about to be done. The house is almost uh, near completion, and then we will be uh, moving out. And with that comes the other opportunity to have uh, additional space again. And so we need to be praying for that. Uh, we could be looking at eight to 10 kids, even in the next year being placed with us because of the uh, difficult situations um, in our area. Excellent. This church loves and cares about you guys. They pray for you, they give, they believe in you, and they want you guys to do great things, and they appreciate you. So thanks for everything. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being my friend. Thank you for letting us join in this work with you. It's, it's really been uh, an incredible experience for us to be able to join in a church. Uh, in this work at the Hacienda Pope. Excellent. Thank you so much. Come down here. We're going to pray for you. Scott, Scott Martin, one of our elders, is going to offer a prayer on their behalf. It's an honor. It's an honor to pray for them because for many years these guys were prayed for and they are an answer to prayer. We uh, went through a period where two years ago, three years ago, we really needed them and God supplied Dear Father, we do praise your name, Father. You are amazing. We are so thankful that uh, we can see your handiwork so easily in the work going on in Ecuador. Uh, such lovely people, such great need. And Lord, we just thank you that you allow us to be a part of it. It is an honor to share your name, to share your hope. Lord, we thank you so much for Justin and Jana, for their hearts, for their efforts, for their wisdom, for the way you have equipped them and then just supplied them to us. We are so appreciative of Jake and Tanya and the work going on at the school. And Lord, we just thank you so much for the gifts you've given us, both opportunities and just to be witnesses of your love down there and the way lives are changing. We ask for protection for the Riggers and, and that, that they, uh, as they move into this new transition, new house, and open up uh, new opportunities for house parents, we just ask your hand and your wisdom, Lord. We thank you so much for allowing us to know them and for allowing them to be a part of your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you welcome them as we stand together, please? This is the season for a new anointing. This is the season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may rise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may rise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for His pleasure all creation sings. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory fill the earth. Let your glory fill the earth. Glory fill the earth. Let 
glory fill the earth. As we declare, this is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. this morning, uh, this is a little bit of an unusual Sunday for us. Normally we have uh, a time of worship where we sing uh, several more songs than we'll sing this morning, and then uh, we'll have a time of teaching, uh, and we're not going to do that this morning. It's a little bit of an important day, a, a lot of an important day for our church, and if you're a guest, we're glad you're here, and actually, it's, it's probably a pretty good time for you to be here to witness something that uh, I guess a lot of people would consider some family business. You don't have to be religious at all to understand the importance of leadership. Uh, in, in the businesses where you work, uh, you probably have had some great leaders and you probably had some not so great leaders. Uh, I know in our, uh, in our politics, in our culture, in our nation, there have been times when we were really, really happy with our state and local and, and national leaders and times when we have not been very happy with them and kind of depends on your politics, I guess, how you feel these days. But regardless, you know how important it is to have good leaders. Well, it's the same with the church. Um, we need good leaders in our churches. Uh, as we read the scriptures, what, what we have concluded, and other people reach different conclusions, we don't have any judgment for that, but as we read the scriptures, what we understand is that God has arranged for leadership in the church 
to be shared among a group of men, not just one man, but a group. God does not invest one man with authority. He invests a group with authority, and that protects the church because, you know, who wants to be a part of a church where you've got like this really despotic ruler, you know, making all these rules, but it also protects the leaders because that, that means that, you know, you know we, they can't be... Um, sort of brought into somebody else's agenda because the group is the one with the authority. So we are adding some new shepherds today, some new elders. That's what we call them in the churches of Christ, elders or shepherds. And we're going to add some new ones today. I'm going to introduce all of them to you. I'll start with our, uh, uh, the original five, the five that are already serving, what we lovingly call the old elders. And then I'll introduce our young or newer elders later on. So as I call you guys, you come on up with uh, your wives. First, Bill and Lynette Bass, you guys come on up. And then uh, Walton and Marna Harless. Also, Barry and Vicki Johnson. And Scott and Sandy Martin. And then... Lee and Julie Potts. Lee and Julie had a big day yesterday. Their daughter got married. So we have video of Lee dancing. <laughs> We're not going to use it today, but it will be used. <laughs> Around October of last year, before Lisa and I even knew you were looking for a preacher, now, we weren't even here then, didn't even know there would be a possibility for us to be here. You did something most churches are neither inclined nor equipped to do. You, you took a hard look at how you were doing. You did an internal assessment. You made an honest appraisal. That's what my friends in recovery call a fearless inventory. In, those are painful, but they are good. Among the things that emerged from that season of assessment was the very real sense that we as a church wanted to be closer to our shepherds, the men who were charged with the task of watching over this particular flock. We recognized that, that five men are simply not going to be able, to use the Bible's terminology, to take care of, watch over, oversee, and shepherd a flock of 500 plus people and at the same time attend to their own spiritual growth, be husbands to their wives, fathers to their children, and hold down full-time jobs outside of their church responsibilities. Taking a fearless internal inventory is not something most churches are willing to do. But listening to and responding to a church that has the courage to do that is not something most elderships are willing to do, but these five men did, which is why I wanted to introduce them first. They have given us exa an example of both wisdom and humility. That is rare, but that too is a good thing. I hope you will continue to remember them in your prayers and be grateful that they were willing to listen and respond. So we're thankful to them for that. We're going to add six men to the group. And so as I call you guys, come on up with your wives. They are Dan and Tammy Beasley. And by the way, these were uh, added at your uh, recommendation. Tom and Christy McKee. Steve and Sandra Owens. John and Michelle Perry. Ken and Suzanne Smith, and Todd and Laurie Beth White. We've also asked uh, one of our members, Hoy Ledbetter, to whom I refer as the Apostle Paul of Twickenham, <laughs> to lead a prayer uh, for our shepherds and for our church. Pray. Now, Father, we are very confident that you're keenly interested in what's going on in this room today. 
And we pray your blessings upon this encounter and upon all that is happening in the congregation. We recognize that the people that are before us today are the result of a great deal of grooming that you've been responsible for, that you've provided them with the influences and the kinds of guidance that they have needed to mature to the point they are today. And we thank you for having been at work among them. We pray that that work will continue, that you will bless them uh, so that they can be fully available and able to c carry on the work of the leadership to which they have been called. And we uh, are confident also that you have affirmed this call and that you're willing to do that. We ask you, Lord, to give each one of them a measure of the Holy Spirit that will be equal to the task before him and that you will bless them with a sense of what the church ought to be and uh, how that the church is uh, on a path uh, to glory and that they will be leaders in, in keeping that before us. We also recognize that, uh, that these people are uh, given the responsibility that will be very demanding and we pray that you will give them the strength as well as the understanding to do what they have to do. We pray also that they may sense the deep love that the congregation has for them so that they might be inspired by that and the recognition of that is a part, of course, your love for them also. Bless them, O oh Lord, and may we have glorious days ahead. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hoy. We, we thought about trying to come up with some charge or oath or pledge for both the church and the, and the elders, sort of a hand, on the, a hand on the Bible moment for all of us. In the end, though, we determined that the best thing we could do would be simply to read what Scripture says to the shepherds and what Scripture says to the church regarding the respect we are to show them and the response we're to make to their leadership. We'd be hard pressed to find more challenging words than those that have already been written. And that too is a good thing. Steve Krieger is going to read what God says to the shepherds. And I'm going to read the, what scripture says to the church in regard to shepherds. You have those scriptures in the, the brochure that we handed you earlier today. So you can follow along if you'd like. Go back and refer to this later on. Steve? God's word to the elders. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message it is, as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the ruler of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And this is God's word to us, to the church. By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith 
God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. God's word to the elders. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This is God's word to the church. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. God's word to the elders. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Now I commit you to God and to the word of this grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Todd White is going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for being our Father, and we thank you for the fact that you have claimed us and you have redeemed us, and you've called us your own. We thank you, Father, that in your Son, we know the Good Shepherd. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help us as a people that we would submit ourselves to you, that we would love one another, that we would serve, 
that, Father, we would be faithful stewards of your word and of the grace that you've given us. I pray, Father, that you'd help us as a people, that we would be who you have called us to be in this community. And I pray that our lives would be an overflow of the work that you do in our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, as we gather today as a family, we're just reminded as we have read your word that you have called us to serve and to love. Father, you've called us to trust you and to regard your words as true. And we pray that those words would be reflected each day in our lives as we seek to know you more and to love you more. And Father, above all, we thank you for Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who is our brother, who is our Savior, who gave his life for us so that we can stand before you clean, not because of what we've done, but, Father, because of what you have done. And we pray that in the life of this church family that meets here, that we would continue to look to you, to depend on you, to trust you, and that, Father, you would continue to lead and to guide and to teach and to help us to do what we cannot do ourselves. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am a sheep and the Lord is my shepherd, watching over my soul. My soul to keep guarding over me ever, watching wherever I go. And when the winds blow, He is my shelter. And when I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. And when the lion comes, He is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. We are His children and He is our Father, watching over our soul. Great is His love for His sons and His daughters, watching wherever we go. When I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. And when the lion comes, He is my victory, constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. And when the winds blow, He is my shelter. And when I'm lost and alone, He rescues me. And when the lion Constantly watching over me. He is constantly watching over me. When I survey the is a touching moment in the last chapter of John's gospel, chapter 21. Peter and six of the other apostles have fished all night and they haven't caught a thing. And a stranger on shore shouts 
a question that anglers have been asked since the very first person figured out how to get into a boat and shove out into the middle of a pond. The stranger asked, did you catch anything? And they answered with an all too common response, not a thing. And the stranger shouted back, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they did. And sure enough, they netted a huge catch of large fish. And while they were trying to haul in the net, John, that the text describes as the disciple whom Jesus loved, John says to Peter in a whisper, I imagine, it is the Lord, which I think Peter already knew because he immediately jumps out of the boat into the water and swims to shore, which is a thing I just absolutely love about Peter. He's always trying to get to Jesus. He'll either walk on the water or swim through it. He doesn't care. When he, find, when he lands on the other side, when he finally swims that 100 yards to the, to the shore, he finds Jesus standing by a fire on the beach, cooking bread and fish. And then Jesus says to Peter, with a wry grin, I suspect, bring some of the fish you have just caught. And they begin to have breakfast together. Verse 13, John 21 says, Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. Now, I know it's not conventional to frame it this way, but that sounds an awful lot like a communion service to me. It involves sinners enduring the awkwardness of encountering the one against whom they've sinned. You ever had that feeling? And grace extended by the one who was sinned against. And bread. That just sounds like communion to me. It gets even more awkward for Peter, though, Listen to John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? We don't know if he's referring to the other disciples or the fish. Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? John says that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed me my sheep. Peter never forgot that seaside communion service, the moment that Jesus reinstated him to ministry. We know that because years later he would say essentially the same thing in a letter he wrote to a group of, to a church in which he would specifically address a group of elders or shepherds. He's, he wrote, to the elders among you, this is in 1 Peter chapter 5, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Take care of my sheep. Every Sunday, we share a symbolic meal, a little bit of bread, a little bit of wine, and a lot of grace. Just for this morning, we're going to add an additional symbolic gesture to what we do every week. Our shepherds, our elders, are going to serve communion. They're going to feed God's flock this spiritual food. It is a reminder to all of us that our elders are not a board of directors or an ecclesiastical group of executives. They are shepherds charged with tending to the spiritual needs of this church. And this bread that they serve us reminds us that we are not here, as Todd prayed, 
because we are good, but because God is. We are not righteous because of our deeds, but because of his. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day where so many significant things in the life of this church are happening. We ask your spirit to indwell every single moment in every single person. We are especially grateful in this moment, however, not for what happened today, but what for happened centuries ago in a place many of us have never been, in an act of violence that we don't even like to imagine, where your son, our brother, our shepherd, our savior, gave his life to redeem us, to buy us out of sin, to set us free, and to earn for us something he knew we could never earn for ourselves. He gave his body for us. As we share this bread, we remember that, and we remember it with gratitude. In his name we pray. Amen. Forbidden, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. Oh. Father, for years now in our culture, we have been terrified of what is in the blood. We take great precautions to protect ourselves. And yet you used something that is almost repulsive to be one of the factors involved in reuniting us with you. 
you have taken something awkward and ugly and have made it a central part of what we do every Sunday to remember. It is truly unforgettable that the blood of Jesus is a part of what bought us out of our slavery to sin. And we'll confess to you right now, we don't understand all the mystery of that, but we accept it by faith and with gratitude. Thank you for this cup that reminds us of all that he lost to give us all that we have gained. In Jesus' name, amen. from his hand he subversive things that we do as Christians, things that are subversive to our culture. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is the only way to have a relationship with God is not just subversive but offensive in our culture. But I think the most subversive thing we do on Sundays is what we're about to do right now. We, we pass the plate and we freely, under no compulsion other than what's in our own hearts, give away money. We put a check or a bill or some coins in the plate 
not because somebody's making us do it or guilting us into it, because that's not how we operate here at Twickenham. It's just, it's our own free will offering. And here's what we do when we say that. Here's what we, what we say when, when we do that. What we're saying is, God, I trust you to provide for me more than this money can provide for me. I do not believe the things that our culture says about possessions and power and money and all they, they say that it can bring me. I trust you. That is a deeply subversive act. And it's one that I, I hope we'll consider as a part of our worship, not just a thing we do to pay the bills, but as a part of our worship to God to say, God, I trust you, not this. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving, this, giving us this opportunity to subvert the very things in, this, in our culture, in our world, the spiritual forces and powers of mammon that would suggest to us that if we're going to be happy and succeed and be cared for, that we have to secure that ourselves and uh, either buy it or take it or seize it. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to say no to all of that and yes to the God who provides in every way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Mark how the heavenly anthem drowns, oh music but its own. Awake my soul and see.
Hey, it's quite likely that something we've said this morning, something we've done, or the way in which we've done it has raised a question or some curiosity on your part, especially if you're a guest. And you, can we, we, just, we know that Christians are weird, and we do weird stuff on Sundays, and, and that from a certain point of view, it really doesn't make any sense. So if, it's, if, if you're curious about why we do what we do and things that we believe or say, we'd love, we're an open book. We may not answer every question, but we'd be more than happy to sit down and talk with you. Just glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. I want to close out with some, uh, some news and notes. I guess the first thing that we should acknowledge is that uh, this, this week is a very, very big week because uh, summer is over. And uh, there are, there's a group of people in this room who are really, really, really excited about what's coming up. And we know you students are ready for it too. So um, 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 keep thinking about that. You'll get it later on today. So school starts, is it tomorrow? Does it start tomorrow? Tuesday. Okay. So we want to, Walton is going to lead us in a closing prayer. Is that right? Is Walton leading the closing prayer? Walton, when you, when you pray, not now. I love doing this because I get to tell elders what to do. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> when you pray, pray for the kids going back to school and the teachers and everybody. Hey, we're going to host a Red, Cross, a Red Cross blood drive on Wednesday, August 5th from 2 to 7 in the fellowship hall. You can go online uh, at uh, redcrossblood.org and sign up using the key code Twickenham. Um, new Wednesday night classes start this week, and there's a full listing in your bulletin about all of that. We uh, are our next spring, which is our instrumental time of worship, is next Sunday, uh, August 9th at 5 p.m., uh, and we will have uh, child care available for children zero to five. And uh, you can call the church office if you need if you need to take advantage of that and let us know that your children are coming. I also want to mention. Grant and Lindsay, they are our youth interns. They've been here all summer. Lindsay reminded me that we, she and I started the same day. So we're going to ask them to stand up so we can give them a hand and thank them for their good work this year. Thank you, guys. Awesome job this year. We appreciate you. Let's all stand. We're going to sing one more song, and then we'll, we'll lead us in a prayer. Over all the earth, you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour. The beauty of my Lord Cause you mean more to me Than any earthly thing So won't you reign in me again Lord reign in me Reign in your power Over all my dreams In my darkest hour You are the Lord Of all I am So won't you reign in me again Lord Lord, it has been a joy to be here. It's a joy to be in your presence. It's a, it's a privilege for us, and for that we're thankful. You are the God of, of yesterday and today and tomorrow. You're the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You're the God of, of everyone. All that we know, all that we have seen, all that we have been a part of is, is a part of your creation through Jesus. And we are thankful for that, Father. We're thankful for new life, 
for the joy of celebrating with the Hanleys over the arrival of Lucy. We're thankful for Justin and Jonna being with us this morning and for the work and for the reasons for celebration of the work that is going on there. Father, we're, we're thankful for the beginning of a school year and for all the promise. And we pray your blessings, especially on the teachers and the students as they anticipate and as they involve themselves in that starting this week. And Father, I'm very thankful for the, the new shepherds that are a part of this congregation. Father, you know that each one of us, we are totally inadequate on our own. Uh, we are totally dependent on you, Father. And apart from the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, we would not know where to turn or what to say or how to be what you would have us to be to each other's and before you. And Father, for that we are thankful. Bless us, Father, this week. Bless this gathering of your people. We pray that you will bless your, your body everywhere throughout the world. Father, for those in harm's way, we pray. For those in leadership of this country and throughout the world, we pray. And Father, we just pray your blessing, your sovereign nature over all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.